It's a great pleasure to be here and to serve as the moderator for tonight's discussion. Um, it's a real honor to participate in one of MOCO's first public discussions about conservation efforts and the ways that art can engage living ecosystems and invite viewers to participate in the protection of the natural world. This evening's subject is rewilding and we will hear from our four panelists um, who will address the role humans can play in rebuilding the fabric of nature. Uh, I am delighted to introduce Carl Burkhart, Carly Vinn, Doug Aitken, and Elise Van Middelen. We will hear from each of these panelists individually at the outset of our conversation, and they're going to introduce us to their practice and their research with slides and videos. So each of them will speak for about five minutes. We will then transition to a set of questions that I will pose to each of the panelists, and that will open up the conversation between them. Uh, towards the end of that conversation, they may ask each other questions. We are not going to take questions from the audience this evening. Uh, that being said, I invite all of you to uh, visit MOCA's website in about a week from now when the recording from tonight's panel will be uh, on the website. So I'm going to begin this evening, just go straight into the content uh, of the conversation. I'm going to begin this evening by welcoming Carl. Carl serves as the deputy director for One Earth and formerly the director of, I'm gonna see if I can get my slides, excuse me, my slides up here. Maybe we can get the slide, the PowerPoint presentation going. Um, we will begin um, by welcoming Carl. He is uh, the deputy director of One Earth and he formerly served as the director of media, science and technology at the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. In his role at One Earth, uh, Carl supports academic institutions and NGOs working on the cutting edge of climate and energy science. So Carl, will you come up? It's so fun to be here. Normally we're at boring climate conferences. You guys are much cooler <laughs> than my normal audience. Uh, I'll try to be as cool as possible. Uh, so <laughs> uh, as, as uh, Temple mentioned, I'm Carl Burkhart with One Earth and we are a philanthropic initiative dedicated to solving the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity. So um, I'm gonna just talk for a second about climate change. I know it's really depressing, but we gotta start with it. <laughs> that um, th with, we just had a suite of reports come out from the International Panel on Climate Change, which is a big international coalition of climate scientists. And we know now that we're at about 1.1 degrees Celsius in average temperature above our historic levels, the early industrial levels. And you guys, probably have seen a lot in the media about these sort of dramatic impacts like glaciers collapsing and, and um, forest fires, especially here in California. And so we really know now that 1.5 degrees um, is really the upper limit before we could enter into a sort of very much more dramatic versions of what we're already seeing. So we have this existential question at One Earth, can we avert a climate crisis? And that, um, you know, and how do we achieve this 1.5C goal? Because it's approaching really fast. So we have assembled over the years a coalition of many different scientists in many different countries to answer different parts of this question. And it's led us into some really interesting places. And one of those is the role of nature in um, as a climate solution, which I think a lot of people, uh, in my background is in energy actually, as, as you mentioned, and um, most people think it's mostly about fossil fuels, which is true, we have to absolutely get off fossil fuels, but nature is gonna be able to buy us a whole bunch of time. Um, and so this question, what is nature's role in the climate crisis has been a lot of the work we've focused on recently. And one of the first, uh, it's, it turns out to be an incredibly complicated, simple question, complicated answer. Uh, and we've, we've funded numerous different um, scientific teams working on different parts of that question. One of them that I'm just gonna show you a quick video of is called the Global Safety Net. And this kind of was like our base layer of understanding, uh, really the question is where is their nature left? And this was a uh, two-year effort. Carly here, who's on the panel, was one of the co-authors, um, peer-reviewed uh, paper that was the first to really take on this question and compiled lots of different research. So we're gonna hear some of the top findings from that right now. Nature is key to rebalancing our global climate system and ensuring a vibrant future for all. Ecosystems absorb carbon from the atmosphere and produce the essentials for life on our planet. Fresh water, clean air, and healthy soil. 
Intact natural lands also help to prevent viral outbreaks like COVID-19. Tragically, in the past 50 years, we've lost half of our natural land, destroying two thirds of all living creatures on Earth. We must reverse the damage, and we can, by creating the Global Safety Net, a network of land areas that are vital for nature and humanity. The Global Safety Net is the first comprehensive estimate of the total land area requiring protection to solve the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. There are six main layers that make up the Global Safety Net. First, are areas already protected by governments, totaling 15% of the planet's land. Second, are species rarity sites. These are additional areas that need to be protected immediately before rare animals and plants are lost forever. Third, are high biodiversity areas, groupings of plants and animals that are vital to maintaining our ecosystems. Fourth, are large mammal landscapes, like the Pantanal wetlands of Western Brazil, home to the world's largest jaguars. Fifth, are areas with a large extent of intact wilderness, continuous forests, shrublands, and grasslands. Sixth, are land areas that provide additional carbon absorption and storage, helping to stabilize our global climate system. The Global Safety Net also incorporates an analysis of potential wildlife corridors, areas of degraded land that can be restored to connect ecosystems back together, allowing nature to be more resilient as the Earth warms. Taken together, the layers of the Global Safety Net total approximately 50% of the world's land, offering a blueprint to restore our biosphere, helping to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius and providing the ecosystem services vital to our survival. Over one third of these lands are communally held by indigenous peoples, which demonstrates the importance of safeguarding territorial rights for these communities. You can explore the global safety net through a new web application, which displays how every country and region can contribute in different ways towards this common goal. Visit gsnapp.org to learn more about your region and how it can contribute towards a world in which nature and humanity coexist and thrive together. There we go. Very dramatic ending. <laughs> um, so the that like what you saw there at the end i like to say that's our carbon sponge like that it holds about two trillion tons of carbon and it absorbs about a quarter of the emissions that we emit that are causing climate change every year and we're really trying to understand the structure how does this machine work it is vastly complex and I wanted to show this because I'm also trying to be cool and show you pretty things. <laughs> uh, this is not a 70s psychedelic painting. Um, it's, it's actually this, a new technology that, that we're exploring right now. Uh, with a satellite that will be launching next year will um, measures actually chemical signatures of individual trees. And it can group the trees. So the different colors are showing different species but then it can group them into types. So you can actually see how trees kind of assemble into colonies. And we don't really kind of have that yet at a global scale. Like we know, it, if you look at satellite pictures on Google Earth, it all just kind of looks like broccoli, you know, when you look down at trees. And this is really peering through the broccoli to understand all the species are. So that's a really exciting direction that's gonna help us figure out where to conserve and also where to restore, which is a big part of rewilding. And I'm gonna end just in a second, but I wanted to, talk about animals because I think when people think of rewilding, it's, it's plants and animals. And um, many, some of you probably have heard of the story of the wolves of Yellowstone. I just want to introduce this one concept. Um, it's, it's important for the conversation moving forward. Um, this was in Yellowstone, basically all the wolves have been totally hunted out. And what happened is without the wolves there, the herbivores like deers just started going crazy <laughs> and they just ate everything effectively and so because of that um, there started to be erosion and there was dirt coming into the river and then there was uh, loss of food for other animals like bears and the whole system actually started collapsing and then in the 90s scientists uh, reintroduced 40 wolves and um, it was they were even surprised how quickly the wolves helped to rebuild that habitat structure of the ecosystem. And they did it because the deers got scared of them being around, so the deers wouldn't come near the river where they were exposed. So all these aspens and cottonwoods and big trees started growing and sucking up a huge amount of carbon. 
So it was kind of like this aha moment that, oh wow, animals actually can help us here with, with the climate crisis. So that's through a process called a trophic cascade, which is what I described, where uh, one animal, a keystone species, actually in, um, has an impact on the whole web of life all the way down to individual plants. Um, and uh, we're actually starting a new uh, scientific consortium called Animating the Carbon Cycle, which is actually specifically looking at the different kinds of roles different animals play. And they all, they're, it's fascinating because the personal lives of animals, they, they do all sorts of different interesting things. Um, we're not going to go into any detail now because we don't have time, but they all, like you see the sea otter there with the kelp, like they're managing kelp forests, which hold a lot of carbon. Tigers are, uh, they found carbon in tiger landscapes is at least twice normal landscapes. And uh, toucans here and t tapers, those guys on the right, which are one of my favorite animals, they disperse seeds um, by pooping a lot and <laughs> eating a lot of different things. And we now actually have some initial research on not how much carbon um, certain species can help us remove from the atmosphere and lower those global temperatures. And uh, whales, there's a new paper just out on whales um, and another paper on forest elephants. And they've proven now that they have a huge role in actually increasing uh, carbon removal. So yeah, so we're exploring 20 species as part of that study. And uh, you're gonna hear from Carly more on a, a large mammal assemblages, which is um, related to this kind of rewilding. So I'll just end there um, and uh, talk more during the discussion. Thank you, Carl, for setting the stage for tonight's conversation. Um, we're next going to hear from Carly. And um, Carly is the director of Resolve's Biodiversity and Climate Team. She provides science support for global biodiversity research and conservation projects. And Carly has led a number of field-based wildlife studies, including a six-year study of wolves, giant anteaters, and jaguars of the Cerrado grasslands. I'm very excited to hear from her, and I'm very excited to have both Carl and Carly here to present their work in the context of an art museum. I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Carly, do you want to come up? All right, so if Carl normally hangs out at climate conferences, I'm normally hanging out with wildlife biologists, so this is also a different sort of pleasurable venue for me. Thanks for having me. So here in California and around the world, images of wild nature beginning to reoccupy or even visit our human-dominated landscapes can really inspire us. And for this to be true, a mountain lion um, here in our region, actually quite a bit of good has to be happening. Um, there have to be wild places that are protected. These places need to be reasonably connected. These species need a good prey base. So truly they can inspire our actions as I know they've done here in Los Angeles, for example, to build some of the world's largest overpasses um, so that they can be a part of our world. But as Carl mentioned, um, efforts are not always necessarily the best when they're focused on a single species or really intensive efforts. And really when we can have groups of species assemblages or full rosters of species that once occurred in a place working together, they can be another type of conservation priority like an endangered species is because these species work together and indicate and create really ecosystem health, but they also provide a lot of services like carbon storage or seed dispersal that, that Carl spoke to. So we've been thinking about how conserving these groups of species together um, can be done. And I became particularly interested in this work when I spent several years, as Temple mentioned, in the Brazilian Cerrado, Brazilian Cerrado, which is a biodiversity hotspot, a grassland that has relatively little remaining intact habitat. And much of the region actually looks like, I mean, even beyond the Central Valley of California, like the Midwest of the US, where it's egg lands, it's monoculture, as far as the eye can see. But incredibly, the region is still home to all of its native and historically present large mammals. So things like maned wolves, jaguars, 
giant armadillos, tapirs, anteaters, more, the list goes on, they still occur there in relatively small but well-protected reserves and thanks in large part to, to private land conservation by farmers and the regions around the parks. So this kind of inspired a question of what is it that is allowing these species to be here? And we began to explore how can we have more of these assemblages in places throughout the world, wild and human dominated? Where do they occur and how can we restore these important, um, important things? And we began with this map of the world that is Carl and I like to call it, um, the, the map of the world that if nature were to draw it, it would look like, because these different colors represent not political boundaries, but rather ecoregions, which are more than 840 ecosystems of regional extent. And one of the things that's so incredible about nature is that as you fly around or go or drop into these different places on Earth, all of them are distinct, and they have these unique plants and animals that co-occur there. And you go somewhere else in the world, and it's totally different. And so, wouldn't we want to rewild not just like a place in Africa or part of the boreal forest, but each one of these ecoregions that has these distinct assemblages? So we use this as a framework in conservation planning to kind of guide our thinking. And so, for example, when we map ecoregion by ecoregion, where are the places that still have all of their historically present large mammals? we can begin to see how these patterns emerge around the world and places that wouldn't surprise us, like the Serengeti, it's famous, of course, for having all the large mammals there. And then places that Carl hinted at where they've been restored. We put back grizzly bears and wolves, so it now stands out. But more interesting, I think, than looking at what's been lost or what still remains is where is their great opportunity to bring back wild nature and these full cast of characters full rosters of species and places. And what's amazing is that when we map this out and look at the data and go around the world, there's opportunities in every realm. So whether it's high mountain landscapes, tropical forests, or boreal forests, deserts, if you ask the question, what are the places in the world that are just missing one to three species, and therefore it should be feasible to restore? We have so many opportunities. When we brought these maps and data to scientists, and managers around the world, they came up with dozens of opportunities that are ripe for restoration in just the next few years. And we know that global scoping and mapping is just step one. The real work, of course, is done by land managers, regional planners, local communities who have to do the work of sitting down, mapping out, and figuring out how this can be done, what measures are needed and need to be put in place. And so for a final slide, I want to leave you also with images um, like Carl's that I thought might be ripe for your walls here in the museum, um, but also that represent the story of my home. Um, I live in Seattle. And here, like in Los Angeles, um, we've got, well, here the population in Seattle is growing. Um, there's a lot of change in our human footprint on the landscape. We're feeling the impacts of climate change, increasing wildfires. And so we're now working to harness the power of freely available imagery and cloud computing to bring this to our land managers. We can now sit in the, in the city and see from the city itself areas that have been reoccupied by wolves and wolverine over the last decade coming on their own, places where land managers have returned fisher, like you have efforts to do with that small carnivore here in California and places that we're working hard to keep snow-associated species like this link shown here on the landscape. And we can now use these dynamic data sets to hand to those people sitting around the table looking at maps so that their decisions can begin to keep up with this very dynamic world that we're trying to rewild. So I'll leave it at that, and thanks a lot, Temple. Thank you so much, Carly. I um, I'm like looking at these um, the the way these colors are coming up, and it like I feel like I'm I don't know I'm looking at an artwork. Uh, so it's really it's fun to see these here. Um, so we're gonna move uh, to uh, Doug. Many of you may know Doug uh, through his exhibition uh, Electric Earth that was at MoCA in um, 2016. 
Um, Doug uh, works across a lot of different mediums. I would say that he creates these installations that are very immersive and have a cinematic component to them. Um, he has a video that I'm gonna play and then he'll come up and talk a little bit. I think you've made this, Doug, if I'm not mistaken, just for this uh, audience, is that right? Yeah, okay, great. I'm gonna play this. It's about three, three, four minutes long. Hey, uh, thank you for making it tonight. Um, I know it's crazy in this concrete jungle we're in um, with all the freeways closed and you know everything, everything disrupted. So um, uh, thanks. And I'm really grateful to be here 
and part of this conversation, this larger conversation. And um, I, I wanted to share these four works with you um, because they all have specific reasons um, and motivations that relate to the landscape or to ecosystems in different ways. So um, I have two minutes, so I'll, I'll try to speed date this. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this um, this talk. But uh, the first piece that was up here was the Sonic Pavilion. And this is a piece that we made maybe about 15 years ago at this point. It's still there. It's in Brazil. And um, it's a work that um, you go to, and at the core of it is this hole that goes quite deep into the earth. And um, there's a series of sensors that pick up the movement of the geological activity, the plates, the earth, for that matter. And... It's live, and you go in the space, and it's, there's something so, to me, so fascinating about the idea of artworks that can live, that can embrace change, that can embrace the ecosystem, or the weather patterns, or the world around us. And, um, you know, this was an interesting work to make because, you know, it was an idea, it took us forever to create it, and now it's there kind of living its own life. And it's, it's one of these kind of moments where, um, people go there and they experience it. And every person, every day, hour, minute, second is experiencing something different. But what they're tapping into is the planet that we're living on. And, and I think one of the key subjects of today, which when we talk about ecology, is it's so easy for us to forget that we're on this space that is actually living and changing continuously. And we kind of move in the foreground throughout our lives and we look at what's immediately around us. But to zoom out and have that kind of macro view and look at the wider perspective, I think is really, um, is, is really at this point, this is so necessary. Um, I don't remember what else we showed. Um, <laughs> New Horizon, New Horizon, um, New Horizon and the underwater pavilions were both collaborations with uh, environmental groups, ecological groups. Um, the flying sculpture was something where uh, the world's oldest land trust is, in, um, uh, is on the East Coast. And um, it's a series of pieces of land that are nature preserves, um, often in random places or large spaces in between. And we were talking about how to do an artwork, how to do an artwork that could activate these spaces and kind of raise an awareness um, to these different diverse regions. Um, the, the organization is called the Trustees. And I thought about it, I thought, you know, this is a situation where we should think outside the box. We don't make a sculpture and we put something there that's uh, motionless and inert. Is it possible to do something different? And I thought about this idea of could we make a flying sculpture? and then actually activate these different parcels of land um, with vastly different ecosystems and use the project as a way to have a dialogue, to talk about this, to share it with people. So each time the, um, this flying sculpture, this balloon would be in a location, we would have happenings and we would you know, invite people who are, you know, I saw your uh, list of Woods Hole uh, Marine Institute or MIT or people from like all walks of life to get together and talk about ideas of the future. And it was kind of culture fracking. We were looking at kind of creating friction between people in different disciplines to see if different new ideas could come out of it because I think culture is very siloed. Um, I'll speed it up. I'm gonna go even faster and faster. This is, I'm gonna be like Atlanta freestyle rap. Um, so, so anyways, um, Underwater Pavilions was a project that I, I was very passionate about creating something um, that was under the surface of the ocean because I felt that, you know, when you look at our planet, over 70% of the Earth is underwater. And we're so, um, we're so detached from the oceans and the marine life and that aspect of the ecosystem. Could it be possible to make an artwork that could allow one to almost have a, a reason a door into the ocean. You know, I think that's one of the things about, about the sea that we find is its immensity is almost intimidating to the point that we see it as simply a horizon line. So in this situation, I wanted to, for any Angelino here, <laughs> this piece was made off Catalina Island on a marine sanctuary. And, you know, the idea was that, you know, you could step outside of your daily life. You could take a ferry across the channel. You could dive or snorkel into these um, underwater constellations. Um, but also, the, 
act of making them could create a bridge and a collaboration with marine biologists, with uh, conservationists. We had people like um, Sylvia Earle, who's an uh, icon of the ocean world, one of the, the person I, I think still holds a record for the deepest human underwater, um, is in her 80s, comes down to the studio and kind of consults on this project with us. And it was just, I mean, just absolutely incredible. Um, you know, seeing this kind of crossover and seeing art kind of erupt outside of the museum space, outside of the gallery space and um, exist in other parts of the world and have a sense of discovery and exploration. So. I'm totally over time, so I'll stop this. But um, uh, anyways, you. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I, I enjoyed the video. I think it's a great way to kind of tra time travel uh, through all your different projects. Um, so we are coming up to our final panelist, uh, Elise Van Millem. Um, Elise, I will say, uh, does know Doug and had worked on, as, uh, served as the project manager for, manager for Doug's Station to Station project. Um, but more recently, she has created over 160 urban forests that use the Milwaukee method of planting. And um, she founded uh, Sugi, which she'll tell us more about. Um, it was born out of her two passions of art and nature. And she's gonna share some uh, video and imagery with us. It's a really beautiful way that she's brought in some illustrations and kind of artistic approaches uh, to inspire. So do you, would, would you like to come up, Elise? Modern life is full of zones that separate us from nature and from each other. But life doesn't thrive in isolation. It needs to be wild, to be tangled up with others. People and places need mess, color, freedom. Sugi gives anyone, anywhere the building blocks to restore ourselves and our world. With your help, we're proving that within every empty lot, every stretch of shoreline, and every new friend and neighbor is wilderness, waiting to take root. Biodiversity brings back the wild. Your wild. Let's wake it up together. Sugi, join the rewilding generation. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, Thank you for having me, it's really wonderful. Um, before I go into telling you more about the forest and that we planted around the world, actually now in 20 countries and all the children that we engaged, I might want to tell you a little bit on how um, someone that has an, actually an art background um, got to create Sugi. You see, I was one of these people overwhelmed um, by the problem today and I wanted to take action but didn't really know how to start and where to start. I knew I wanted to invest in nature and I knew I also wanted to plant trees and f be able to follow the story of my trees. Like, what is really going on? Um, what kind of ecosystem restoration are these trees doing and what kind of bi biodiversity are they bringing back? And as I was going through the many options that are out there, um, I just couldn't understand it really well. Like, it all seemed very far away and I questioned how they were being planted and let alone how many survived. And after a bit of research, I got to know the Miyawaki method. It's a Japanese method of mimicking what was once there. So by creating these forests that we do today in, in spaces such as you can see, um, we bring back what was once there through, through an, an analysis of native species. So, we plant very densely, and I'll, I'll tell you more about the technique later. But the, the idea really is here to bring these forests in our urban settings, right where you live and work. We plant a lot in schools, but we also create biodiversity corridors um, in more rural areas. So we do both. And whilst we're doing that, we've been able to engage a lot of children, 12,000 children till today, in 70 schools around the world. Um, and so that idea of, of really reconnecting people to nature was very appealing to me and also to have that accessibility and that transparency. 
And so to give you a couple of ideas where we've been planting, so for example in London, central London in the UK, um, you've got these typical London plains, but what really happens in that space in between, that sort of negative space? So we try to transform, and this is where the art also comes in, like if you think about sculpture, you know, you can put it into a city, well, why not bring those forests closer and plant them with the children? So today this forest is seven months. Um, biodiversity is already coming back, it is buzzing. Um, this is a forest that we planted, and I'll show you a couple of them, in Berkeley, California. There we actually took away the grass that was surrounding the school, because why keep that grass, you know, the cost of watering it with our climate that is changing. So we transformed it into a forest. I went to visit it on Friday and look how it is already thriving. So again, with this method that we're planting, creating an ecosystem, those trees very quickly start to communicate underground. We bring back the soil biology that's part of the method and um, have a lot of laughter and children involved because they bring um, the forest alive. Um, this is another school, Malcolm X in Berkeley. And then this is quite a, a special project. It's in Toppenish, right out of Seattle, two hours out of Seattle. There we planted a forest with a correctional facility with the Yakima Nation. And so when we plant, for example, in the US, and actually we're anywhere in the world, but definitely in the US, we really love to engage the native tribes because they are the original stewards of the land and they understand really like how can we bring, this, bring back this alignment. This was just soil without life. And today, this forest, well, it was planted in, in several phases, but the 19-month forest, uh, too bad we can't play the video, but it is an incredibly sensory experience. So because of that density, immediately you have a, a place where migratory birds can come. You can an enormous return of like uh, pollinators and not to mention what's going on in the soil. Um, we were talking about it the other day. What if we could put sensors in these forests? Right, Carl? <laughs> would be great. So and then also we plant around the world. Um, in, in India we did a project, 100 schools, 100 forests. I mean, think about it um, in, in, with those temperatures that they have today. Emile, for the children, they have um, places where they can cool down but also take classes. We love the idea of the outdoor classrooms. Um, again, as I told you, like we've done 70 schools now and definitely now in the US we're taking that lead too. Um, these, you can see at one year, what kind of uh, change you can create. It's a, it's a real transformation of spaces, sort of a, a making a negative space into a positive place. And then, of course, the people that are at the heart of Sugi. We do love to engage um, um, with anyone. Is it, you know, teams that come and plant with us? Is it, you know, you can see there's a Louis Vuitton team there. Um, we work a lot with, with um, corporations on that. And then the children, um, the laughter you get there is amazing. But then in Cameroon, all of a sudden, you know, you have women that write us and thank us that they actually can take part in a male task. And so it is really for anyone and everyone. And um, yeah, by planting these forests, we hope to leave the healing and learning sites for future generations um, right where they live. So thank you. <laughs> I'm very excited to hear more about the Milwaukee method and how that's described um, once we get into our questions. Um, so we're gonna transition now. I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna all have our individual mics. And um, we're going to um, kind of go through some questions. Um, I just wanna say that it is really um, exciting to have, as I mentioned before, Carl and Carly here in this context, and Doug, and they know each other, obviously, Carl and Carly, and then Doug and Elise know each other, so I think we're gonna have some interesting conversation come out of this. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so let's start maybe with a kind of a basic question to get going, which is what does rewilding mean in a changing world? Do we have any volunteers? Carl? Everyone's looking at me. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? 
Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a little low. Um, put me on the spot. Uh, it, you know, I think um, one of the things uh, we talk about is resilience, and um, climate change is how ha- you know, as you know from my presentation, where climate change is really our top level um, mission is solving climate change and. There's two parts of that. One is, you know, reducing all the bad stuff so that we can have uh, better concentration of CO2, less warming, and everything goes back to normal. Um, but we know there's going to, and we have a climate model, by the way, if people want to look, check it out on our website that shows how we can do that. Um, so we know it's possible. It's actually not even that expensive. Um, and uh, there's a lot of... Uh, controversy about <laughs> how to solve climate change, but it, it's actually fairly straightforward. And um, so that's called mitigation, right? That's like fixing the problem. Um, but there is, when you look at uh, the greenhouse gas models, which are this complex modeling system to look at how all the different chemicals are gonna interact as we warm up and then cool back down, we know that it's just going to be a different planet this century. And so resilience, is something we have been talking a lot about. And in in the end of the global safety net, where you saw all the little yellow lines connecting together the different ecosystems, that actually is the net in the global safety net, um, which I didn't explain very well (laughs) in the beginning, but it's really critical because species are going to move. So uh, plants and animals will move to try and find the conditions that they enjoy. And so um, by, by doing the, like Carly can talk about some of the connectivity and corridor work, um, for rewilding, we're especially focused on how you link up these refugia, that's what we call them, refuges. Refugia are these pockets of land where we have those wild animals and plants still there. You need to connect them. So um, that allows those species to, to move um, and then actually repopulate, keep their genetic stock going. There's a great example of a project in Brazil with tamarind monkeys where um, a road had cut across this forest and it had created two different um, families of, of um, uh, tamarind monkeys, which are these really cool orange, bright orange monkeys. And, um, but they were uh, inbreeding too much because they, they were scared of the road. So this one corridor project, which actually was an overpass, I think, in that case, so they, brid- they made a little bridge for the monkeys <laughs> so they could like mate and date, date and mate, and then the populations really rebounded, rebounded. And so, you know, connectivity is resilience. I guess that's like my big kind of aha, and Carly and I have talked about this a lot, that um, how the weaving part of weaving back nature is taking what we have now and how do we re- reconnect it? So I guess that's like top of mind. Uh, do you want to elaborate any on that, Carly? Sure, I'll just add a little bit, which is that um, the question rewilding in a changing world is really good to me because we can't just go back to what was there, and I'm really interested to hear what you say, because we need to think about how, instead of rewilding like what was there historically, we need to think about what's going to be there in the future. And while we don't want to like, be you know, engineers kind of geo-designing these species and putting them in places, the things, and so it creates a lot more challenge in terms of, okay, how do we think about what species as we're rewilding are appropriate to put back? Um, the thing to me that's really exciting is the best thing that we can do is the best thing to do anyway, which is to have more areas that are protected, more habitat available, and have them more connected. And so the things that we've always known that we should do to conserve nature and allow it to, to, to move and thrive, um, we just need to do more of in a changing world from the perspective of, of species. So. Love to hear from you, too. Mm-hmm. Do y'all want to try to answer the question? Should I go? I think yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah, please. Hi. Um, so, I mean, Carly, I'll answer you, but from personally, in that changing world, it, uh, the aspect of rewilding has, is twofold for me. There's a personal rewilding. It's like we live on Zoom screens. We live inside. We live in concrete jungles. Like how can we reconnect to that ancestral feeling? Like, and I think Sugi, the name just, 
as a side note because it means um, Cryptomerica japonica is the Japanese um, tree, and it means tree in Japanese, but it's the sister of the redwood. And having lived in San Francisco for six years, I always loved going into those redwoods in silence and just listening and reconnecting. And travel, we travel a lot, we move a lot, I mean, pre and post COVID, but that always being connected on our phones, on our technology, just to disconnect and to reconnect with ourselves is like, for me, a big piece why Sugi came about. Um, and then to the other point, I mean, and we see it also in between, but the children, like many, many have never touched soil. They ask, can we touch the dirt? I'm like, please go for it. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, you know, we, we also give them worms to put into the soil to, to aerate it. And first they never want to touch it. And then two minutes later, they're throwing worms at one another. <laughs> so it, it is really that, that also that playfulness um, and, and that bringing back of people. But then the other aspect of rewilding is like, can we really transform these spaces? And w as I mentioned, we worked a, a lot with um, a Native American, uh, Mary Lee Smunity Jones, and she's a, a gatherer by birth. And I asked her the other day, because reading, you know, braiding sweetgrass, like, can we really bring back the magic of the ancient forest? And she said to me, listen, the magic cannot be measured. We had no life in the soil, and look how the forest is buzzing. The elders are already picking the berries to make teas for the community. I think, you know, at that point, we're like in a positive way forward. Yeah. Little by little. It's pocket by pocket. But we'd like to do this on the big size. <laughs> Thanks, Elise. Doug? Um, I, I think just to pick up where you left off, uh, Elise, that idea of acceleration. And I think that's a really um, key component of the 20th century and the 21st century. And we're kind of living these lives that are. Um, they're accelerating the quantity of information, the amount of experience, um, images, kind of the pulsing of the society around us, the BPM. And I think in a lot of ways, the faster we go, the shallower we move. Um, we see more quantity, but we have less of a root system. And I think that's really what's been lost if we kind of you know, look back on our um, traditional relationship with the natural landscape. And, you know, that idea of rewilding, you know, which I think you, you touched on is, is it as much the natural landscape is a, as it is us re-experiencing, reconnecting, kind of, um, you know, breaking the glass in front of us and stepping into the real. So I think there's kind of an opportunity for a return to the real post uh, this COVID period, because I think what had happened is we've really, you know, reached this maximum acceleration rate and COVID hit, and we're just completely living on the screen life. Um, you know, for a while I know, you know, we're not even going outside really. It was like UV lights and plastic gloves. So I think that there's, there's an opportunity for us as a society to seize this moment. I don't think it's gonna last long, but I think we really have to kind of hold on to this and not fall back into our traditional patterns and to really, um, you know, seek out this this living world around us and you know how can we work with that how can we harmonize with it but um to, to me it's just an incredibly um fascinating but urgent 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 subject <laughs> you go ahead <laughs> um i think maybe kind of building off a few things that y'all have you, you've brought up i wonder if we could talk a little bit about um maps and networks and how that comes into the practice or the research that you're either doing or you're supporting. We talked a little bit about the over the overpasses and the importance of that. For those of you who don't know, I, 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 maybe Carly would be better equipped to share this, but it, just to be really clear, it's like the, the roads and the highways are really um, uh, very bad for our natural environment. And so having these overpasses can allow just like, they're really critical. So that's a very visual, like a very clear visual um, kind of connection and a mapping. But I wonder if any of you, if you wanna talk about maps and networks in your, your work. Yeah, everyone's looking at me because I'm the map nerd. <laughs> yeah, we're obsessed with maps and um, also understanding like what maps are. If we, if just, the journey for us at One Earth with Maps actually started with our work in the Amazon and working with four indigenous tribes. And, um, you know, our version of what a map is, is, is different 
than theirs. <laughs> and, um, and so actually in that, in that project, we um, funded this really amazing work to co-design some software for them to be able to create maps and build maps um, that, that were set, made sense to them, were sensible to them. And there were, there were no lines. Uh, so it was really a map of places and names. And um, some of them were secret, so they had to create like little special icons. So they ended up, um, and it's actually, there's scientists that study this form of map making, but it's, it's clouds of points of information start to draw their own shapes. And um, whereas if you had gone into an indigenous tribe, which used to happen where the scientists would fly in and then map the stuff and fly out, um, it was a very extractive kind of mapping, if you will. And so this was a collaborative mapping with the indigenous people. And what ended up happening, which was amazing, is they were able to map like centuries of history and this is where the animals go to lick the salt and this is where these birds go and this is where the river comes part of the year and we get these fish. And, and then that ended up being used in a court case where um, these tribes actually won the right um, to kick off this oil company off of its land, which is a pretty legendary, um, uh, you might have seen it in the news recently, uh, last year. It was a big, it took a long time, but it was ruled in their favor. So that was to me, uh, was the the power of maps and um, and then I showed you this this sort of psychedelic looking one, um, you know we because we're not in nature it, unless you go into one of her forests in the city uh, we need this abstraction to understand and um, they are they are just really powerful and they're just going to get incredibly sophisticated so I think that's part of the thing we're really excited about is that um, once you know that like we showed that there's colonies of, an, uh, of, plant, of trees that choose to live next to each other. Like they, the birds are dispersing the seeds everywhere, right? Like, but certain trees are, are kind of deciding <laughs> that they all need to be on one side of the river and these other trees on the other. And like, we don't, we can't see that unless we have the map. And, and maybe the indigenous wisdom, they know that, of course, but we, for us, it's important for us to be able to see it so we can help get it funded, essentially, and protected. Carly? Yeah, I think in addition to everything Carl said about maps representing places and um, being used for planning, the other thing they do is maps bring together people so you mentioned networks, and we can think of maps as networks or road networks, corridor networks, but also for all of our work, I think bringing people together is so important. And I just find that the minute you get in a room and you put maps down, like everyone comes around the table. And just one like story, for example, the, the photo I have of, uh, um, in the presentation of of a dozen or so people in a room with the maps around. Um, these were like agencies had been trying to figure out in Washington State how to get links reintroduced to the state for like 10 years and going through all the bureaucracy and the management plans and this and that. And we had a transboundary meeting that was about something entirely different. And some folks from Canada and First Nations from Canada were there and looking at the maps of the Washington State links managers and they said, oh, you have a links problem. Like our links can't get to Washington State because of this you know, block, basically this valley that's getting developed. You guys have had way too much habitat burned up. We've got plenty of links here. You know, we're trapping them and managing them actually. And they got together and had planned this whole restoration effort and um, ended up sending links from British Columbia to a, a First Nations tribe in Washington State who's now reintroduced them and they're reoccupying the national forest. And really I think it was because like one group of individuals happened upon another group's maps and started a conversation. So I think maps bring us together. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree. I mean, I love maps. Don't. <laughs> I mean, really, do you remember mapping station to station? I mean, yeah. it's just magical. Um, but so, I mean, with, with Sugi, we don't, we don't look really at maps on such large scale because for us, when we look at, you know, how do we mimic what was once there? You know, we have to really go back to, is it literature? Is it seed banks? Is it museums? Is it, 
it's hard sometimes if there's not, no record of nothing. Um, so you have to go and try to find the pockets that are still there of ancient forest, or is it a shrine with a couple of ancient trees? And then you do your forest design, which is a sort of mapping, because with the method of planting, so that Japanese method called the Miyawaki method, we plant few, uh, three to four trees on um, a square meter that's 10 square feet. And so um, that means that we need to really understand the layers of the forest, shrubs, subtree, tree, and canopy, because other than you know, monoculture, we don't just plant very traditionally, like it needs to be wild. And, and I think there the mapping is incredibly important because you know, how do you create that network underground so that they can feed from one another, that also that they can grow up and one will have support the other because you know, who will take the most light, who will take the less light. So it is, it's, it's quite important to map that forest when we plant it. There's a, a randomness to it. That's why you know, planting with kids is brilliant. You know, they just run around and they just put these trees in. We will start thinking about it. You know, when you plant with adults, it's really interesting. Um, but, but so that, that, is, that is very to essence to us, to understand the native species. And there's always a variety between 20 to sometimes in, in Australia and Queensland, we've got over 100 species. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, Brazil, the rainforest, we did so over 600 we found species. So, but you know, when you want to mimic, yeah. So. Doug? I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, not a mapper. <laughs> Sorry. Could you? Could I, I, I like maps, but, but I do I do want to loop back for a second because, you know, as you were talking about them, it dawned on me that really maps are narratives. They're, they're ways of communication. They're where, ways of telling stories, you know, and you can take any piece of land and you can kind of, you know, excavate a history out of it, and that can be geological, cultural. And I think that, that, that what I share with you in a very different way, a different sector, um, is that idea of, of narrative, of how an artwork can trigger a narrative, or how it can open up a set of possibilities or discoveries. And you know, the cartography that we use are projects like Station to Station, where we have a train that goes 4,000 miles across America and passes through these, um, oftentimes, you know, small towns that are, are kind of left behind. And, and how can we share? How can we cross-pollinate? How can we um, with New Horizon, like a series of happenings and activations. Um, so I think, that, I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in in this kind of larger conversation is the idea that you know, we have science and ecology and you know, this, this movement which is um, you know, very, uh, it's, it's a very focused, very researched um, sector of society. And then we have this kind of space in between where there's um, a larger public and oftentimes, that space, there isn't a bridge. There isn't a bridge for that coyote to cross the freeway, um, <laughs> metaphorically. Um, and I think that, that that, to me, is something that's very interesting when we look at culture right now. And I mean the arts, all the arts, you know, whether that's, that's you know, film, music, um, visual arts, anything, architecture, is how can we you know, look at these, these areas of culture and how can they be more proactive? And you know, that might be something like the materials that's used in architecture. You know, can you use um, you know, bioconcrete instead of concrete? You know, can you use materials that are reclaimed? Can you use new forms of fabrication? And I think that, that, that really um, you know, these possibilities are in front of us, um, but we have to be proactive. We have to kind of make, make a statement. We have to vote for these things. We have to vote in our own personal lives in terms of what we want and what we want to activate. So. Um, uh, I think I think that idea of mapping is, you know, it's it's really um, it's it's really comes back to storytelling, which comes back to human communication in a lot of ways. Yeah, I was thinking about politics. I don't know if you intended to go there, but I was thinking with Carly when you were talking about the maps. Some of these people, like we found, there's this poll that in America, you know, we think it's just so divided, black and white. But when it comes to ecology and landscapes and nature, it's it's like 85%, 90% of America wants more parks, more natural areas, wild wilderness. And I was thinking about your table, Carly, if you, if you have that space for collaboration, you can sort of dissolve um, these artificial constructs that are that from the screen uh, absorption that we've had over the two years, I think is like 
acted like a centrifuge to spin people out to two ways of thinking and in in these kind of collaborative acts like you you could imagine a, a, a trumper hanging out with an ecology uh, ecologist and actually collaborating constructively so it kind of makes me I, I think, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but it makes me think that maybe ecology and, and this kind of work and rewilding is actually, a, a, could be a political act. And I actually was wondering for you, I don't know if we get to ask other people questions yet, but I was wondering in cities like of the politics, and it ma makes me think of Christo too, like that the art is partially just the politics of getting the permits and everything, but like, is do you see different kinds of people coming together to do these or when you build those forests or are they, is it pretty much like the hippies and their kids? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually bringing a lot of people together. But what is interesting, and maybe that's mapping again then, but is where you plant. I mean, in India, if you say, let's plant, okay, let's plant. You know, maybe you'll find a pipe under the ground or something, but that wasn't on the map, you know. But then you come to the U.S. and <laughs> that's a whole nother um, <laughs> conversation because <laughs> everything needs a permit. And so you can't really, I wish we could be like more hippie about it and just go plant. We, it is so, rich and so many people need to be part of the conversation. Um, but there's good, I mean, there's good ways to do it now, like w because we planted those three school forests. There's now a movement starting this called the Green the Schoolyard. And so that's happening in California because there was, if I'm not mistaken here, even in LA, I always heard like schoolyards sh should have all concrete because otherwise it's dirt, you know, when you have to. And so there is this movement happening now to, to rewild, to, to bring back that green in the, and so it's not easy. Like in the UK, we're pretty, Easy going, really. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but the Swiss not. <laughs> so does that answer? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to also, so we can jump away from these questions. Is that cool? <laughs> okay. Um, so, <laughs> just just uh, the the last piece that I showed, I want to um, share the idea behind it with you because it kind of it links back to um, Elise, your project. You know, and I was looking at the idea of, of, of artwork and, you know, could an artwork be a system that could um, be a continuum? That's not something that is made and it's finished and it's uh, destroyed or carted off or put in storage. So with that last project, um, Green Lens, we um, had this opportunity to do something in Venice, Italy. And I thought about it. I thought, you know, this pace is, you know, covered with history. And it's almost um, suffocating in some ways. There's so much history there. And um, I started doing research, and I found this island, which, um, which um, was almost abandoned. And um, during Napoleonic era, they had made weapons there. They made gunpowder. And they'd continue to make weapons until the early 60s when they abandoned the island because they thought it was too toxic. And there was a forest there, and the forest was about a third of the island, and the rest of it was just kind of parched land. So I thought about this. I thought this could be an opportunity that we could create an artwork, and the artwork could activate the space. So we reached out to the botanists that were studying the island. We um, talked to them, and we said, you know, what are the indigenous plants that should be here in this forest? And what would happen if we created this artwork? You know, we have it there for a certain period of time. Um, you know, months, and um, what would happen if the artwork is entirely made out of reclaimed materials and all the vegetation that we use for the artwork is indigenous to the island, so that like a glacier that melts, when the artwork is finished, it's replanting. And we have hundreds of trees and bushes that are indigenous to this space that are now growing there. And the artwork's disappeared. Um, the vegetation, the forest is continuing its life in a richer, um, more dynamic way. And, and I think that, 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 that to me, that project was, it was challenging to make, but I, I, it was metaphorically, I was trying to find a way to get away from um, this kind of temporary quality that we live in. And how can we have systems instead of um, flashes? So.
I think I think that kind of brings up a question of site specificity because it sounds like everything you were using things from that island. Is that right? Like that the, it was reclaimed and there was like a specificity to the island. I wonder if we could talk any of the other panelists to this idea of site specificity in your research or your practice. You're totally site specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and also we. For example, we will search for n nurseries that are as close as possible to the site, so they have grown, so the saplings have grown in the same conditions as the site, to really be precise and and also like to advance that growing of the forest. Um, so yes, it's site specific, and then it's also w with the species that we select. As I um, explained to you, we we try to really find what w what would fit there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and you're also talking about how to have less of a carbon footprint in terms of what is there. Totally. Materials also. Absolutely, but you know, again, this, those saplings, it, this is the key to our, our forest, right? And then of course the mulch, because all of forest, we put a layer of mulch on, so you've got to find the farms that are close by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was thinking about, I don't know, I'm going to um, this crazy project, I've decided to turn my front lawn into a pollinator meadow. <laughs> and being like the OCD person that I am, I did, went on this huge like year and a half journey to understand all the plants. And I, I was thinking like, why, why am I so obsessed with this? Like, uh, you know, cause you could go to the store and buy like the pollinator mix in the Home Depot. Now at this point, even Home Depot is getting into the rewilding game. And, um, but you know, I wanted to know like what was there and I'm like, well, why, why am I so obsessed with this? Like, and actually I, I was so moved by the work that you showed and I'm like starting to figure out why I was so moved. And I think it's that, um, it's like, you want to place yourself in history somehow. Like I want to be able to have like a spiritual connection with my front line. I do want the pollinators. I want the bugs. I want the pretty flowers, but I actually want to feel like like maybe this is a, a snapshot of if I were here a thousand years ago. And I don't know why I'm like craving that feeling. So maybe there's a, the site specificity also has to do with like connecting to time and, yeah. and trying to really feel, which is sort of a spiritual inclination. It's like, I want to feel part of this. And I can't just do that just physically. It has to be temporally too. Um, anyway, your projects were making me think of that, that, that you could almost be like for a second you're in the primordial forest where time doesn't exist almost. That's really the goal of it. I mean, also if you think about it, most of our cities are built upon ancient forests. I mean, Seattle for one, I think they kept a little pocket in there just to show what it was once. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Um, but, but truly, I mean, there are certain forests because we started three years ago, so some forests are three years now. Think about it in Beirut, we planted that forest in a revolution, then came the blast, and now this has become, it's also that idea of reclaiming public space. And of course, you know, through your work, Doc, you know, that's a lot also what you do. Um, but in Beirut, they took away public spaces because it's not a good ID to have people congregate. So there we actually created the movement to reclaim that space. And so today when the people come together there, it's also a place of hope, you know. And a lot of, um, because as you said, resilience, you know, these forests, nature is complex. And without that complexity, yeah. we don't have that resilience, yeah. Mm. So, so. I'll just add that hearing all of your comments, but I think also just the presence of all of you here and your interest, it's made me think um, recently after we published the study that I spoke to a little bit, um, you know, once in a while journalists still call and they'll say, okay, so why do we really need large mammals? Like, what's their role? And so I'm thinking like, okay, how many studies can I reference about how important they are? And like, okay, and what do they do for ecosystems? And I'm like, okay, I can think of another six papers about what, and then at the end of the day, I just kind of, and I think I might have once or twice just said, and also they're just amazing and they inspire <laughs> us and we want them here. And I don't know, I'm just thinking like, it doesn't always have to be science. Like these things make us feel good yeah. and I think indigenous people will tell us they need them for spiritual and cultural awareness but I think your points in the pandemic and everything like all this stuff just makes us feel good to do and makes us more whole very well said very well said and I think it's I think 
art can sometimes, to draw a little bit of analogy here, I think when you're in, in this experience of like looking at an amazing animal, it can be somewhat similar to this experience or in an amazing forest, it can be somewhat similar to like experiencing an amazing exhibition of art. And there's something there that's very interesting and I think it's also why it's so curious to me that MOCA has this environmental kind of committee and this effort. There's a real harmony there. They're very different. Um, our natural world and our artistic world historically are very different, but I think that they have a very similar effect and they, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's quite interesting, yeah. Do you, does anyone else wanna say anything else? Any other questions for each other? I, I don't know, when you were talking to him, I was just thinking about LA. I lived here for 13 years and um, just felt like just so devoid of nature. Although now that I've been away and it, maybe it's a good month, I've come back and it's like, oh my God, the Jack Rondas and all, all this stuff. And I could, maybe I was too busy to notice, but I was thinking about like Mo, how cool it is that Mocha's doing this. And, and I was thinking about rewilding and um, just there's a project happening in Philadelphia, in Kensington. So, and this is getting, where I'm going with this is social justice and an art practice and also rewilding in Philadelphia. So Kensington is this horrible, like really bad area of Philly. And there's a lot of bombed out sites, um, you know, where buildings have collapsed. And there's uh, pollinator meadows occurring now. And we got to get a Sugi forest in there somewhere so we should talk afterwards but um and yeah we're, we're supporting some of these projects to kind of rewild these little pockets in some of the worst parts of philadelphia and i was i was just thinking that would be a really cool thing for la too because there's um there's this a nonprofit called lot to spot that was looking at lifting up old asphalt and actually reclaiming it for nature um and i don't know i was thinking maybe that would be something cool that mocha could get involved in like expanding into the community and um, really in some of these areas that are, you know, have struggled in terms of poverty, like to bring that back would be, I think, a powerful, um, just a powerful intervention. I mean, deep paving, we have a lot to do about it, yeah. Have you um, deep paved yeah, in Yeah, in Belgium, your, in Belgium yeah. we transformed a parking lot into a forest. Wow. Um, but think about all these abandoned sites today. I mean, what if we yeah. could, I mean, make, turn them into lush forests, yeah. Yeah, but, and then to your point, you know, low income neighborhoods, um, or if you look at a city and today, where do people go sit when it's so hot or where do you want to yeah. park your car under a tree? So wherever we can, we should, this is the best cooling systems ever, <laughs> simple. I guess I'll kind of wrap up with a question, which is about kind of the West Coast. I know you've worked on the Berkeley Project, Elise. Is there any, and Catalina Island for you, Doug, with um, the underwater pavilions, is there any other thing that you want to touch on kind of along the West Coast or the Southern California area? You, did you talk about the Cascadia Project? Oh, um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm volunteering just to volunteering because it's so cool. <laughs> you talked about um, Yeah, he's referring to um, the region. Some of those maps that I was that I showed that were dynamic and moving at the end are an effort that we started a little bit north of here, but hopefully moving into this region as well to kind of capture the um, the landscape as it's cha changing and, and translate that for, for managers, um, but then also project into the future so that as we're thinking about rewilding and bringing these species in places, they can see into the future how these are likely to be shifting and change and, and according to that. So we've had really good interest here in California in particular um, at the state level and with the leadership here to, to do planning with, um, with some of those tools in the background. So that's been great to see. And one other, we have, so on One Earth's website, we have this thing called the Project Marketplace where we index, and I was looking in California specifically, but um, there's also rewilding in agricultural land, mm -hmm. which is something we, we don't have any farmers here in this group, but it's actually, uh, there's a project there that I was just looking at, it's a 150 acre conversion of an old cotton farm in the Salinas Valley, and there, uh, there's all these interesting interventions you can do on farmland while still maintaining the productivity of the land and 
that has to do with rotating um, different kinds of crops other than cotton and also introducing um, pollinator um, sort of rows inside so that there's a lot more insect activity. And so we didn't get into it, but even in agricultural land, really rewilding, it's like you said, as someone said, every, we need to rewild everywhere, like all the time. <laughs> and, and so that includes cropland, cities, you know, these remote, we have to rewild in remote areas, but I'll, we got to do all of it. Yeah, I think these biodiversity corridors are quite extraordinary. I mean, we can see it also in, in Australia. I mean, a lot of over-farmed land and just left alone there and it, an incredibly, um, yeah, the population of endangered species, just the decline is, mm -hmm. yeah, quite amazing yeah. with the mahogany, mahogany glider and cassowary bird. But what, just to your point also for Berkeley, I mean, I think it, I'm hopeful with those three that we planted and three more that we're doing in next fall that we can bring that school ID mm -hmm. also to LA because we've been trying for a year, but just very hard to get that conversation going in the schools here. Mm. Would be good. That's Do a really, forest. Really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Or next to the mocha. Mocha can it influence. All right. Any other questions for each other? No? No? Well, I want to hear what your next project is. <laughs> can oh. you share it? <laughs> I, I, I just want to um, share one idea, you know, because we're all sitting here at MOCA, um, an amazing museum that was actually founded by artists as a reaction to other institutions in LA. And, um, and I think that we should always push the idea of what culture can be, not what it has been. And, you know, we're here tonight, we're all in this together, um, sharing this interest in the subject that you guys are um, working on and spearheading. And I think that maybe we should question the role of the museum. And maybe the role of the museum itself is not only a space for containment, but it's also something like a lighthouse that's pushing out projects, pushing out creativity. It's sharing uh, experiences. And maybe the museum can be the starting point to activate us to go on bold new journeys that we would never normally experience. And um, you know, I think that that's, there's something there. And um, that's, that's one of the things that I find myself constantly kind of chipping away, trying to, trying to make things real. And, um, and maybe that's uh, a bit of what tonight's about, is the return to the real. So. Um. Thank you, guys. Thank you.